Welcome back, folks. Hopefully it wasn't too cold. Okay? <laughs> Very good. All right. Call your next witness. Testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So, I'll be glad. I do. Have a seat. Ms. Kipke. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Can you please introduce yourself to the jury and spell your last name? Uh, yes, my name is Tiffany Nader, and it's spelled N A D E R. And how are you employed, Ms. Nader? Um, I'm a latent print analyst with Marion County Sheriff's Office. And how long have you been with the Marion County Sheriff's Office? A little over 11 and a half years. And what type of training did you receive to do the, your current position? Well, we, I spent approximately four years um, within the department with um, latent fingerprint training. And then we also have, I also have approximately 625 uh, hours in specialized training in the science of fingerprints, both basic, advanced, where we also train with Florida Department of Law Enforcement, um, FBI, um, we also teach um, and train within Ron Smith and Associates, which is a forensic um, school. And then we have our on-the-job training that we do where we shadow with a master examiner. Okay. Um, do you still go through ongoing training to do your job? We do. And what type of training is it, do you engage in for things that continue throughout your career? We can just continue to take classes with Ron Smith and Associates, or we can take at the different colleges, wherever the schools may be. We can take continual training. Ms. Nader, have you testified before and were permitted to give your opinion as it relates to fingerprint analysis? Yes, I have. And approximately, if you can estimate, how many times? I would say approximately 60 times. At this time, Your Honor, I would tender the witness for any cross-exam regarding her qualifications. No objection. No questions, Your Honor. Right. You may proceed. Ms. Nader, what is a latent fingerprint? Um, the word latent or a latent fingerprint, what the word latent means is that it actually um, can be invisible, so just because you can't see something latent means that it isn't until they actually add a processing technique to that surface that it actually can become visible to the human eye. So some of the most common um, forms of processing would be uh, black fingerprint powder. And basically, um, to create a latent, you have a special type of skin that lies on your fingers. It's actually from nail to nail, and the whole base of your joints, the whole base of the palm, all the way off to the side, which we call the writer's palm. Um, you have this special type of skin, and it grows as well as the whole base of your foot, all the way from the heel to the toes. And it's <coughs> raised and lined with pores. So this special type of skin has the pores, and when the pores are secreting out, it's mainly water. It's 98% water is what you're secreting or perspirating. And the other 2% are your amino acids, salt, and lipids. Um, they can be fatty acids. And so when you're touching an uh, object, are, are holding something, you have the potential to leave behind a latent print um, due to the residue or the moisture that you're leaving behind from that skin friction ridge detail that's actually seeping out. Are fingerprints in, uh, separate from each individual person? Does everybody have their own fingerprint? Yes, they're unique. Okay. Even with identical twins? Correct. They're biologically unique, even with identical twins. Are there any types of surfaces or conditions that are most accommodating for latents to be re recovered? Well, to get a latent print, um, again, it goes back to secretion. So if somebody, you could watch me actually touch this smooth, clean object, and somebody could go, come by and actually process it, it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to leave a fingerprint behind, like, wish it's automatic. It's always by chance. and. Um, for example, if I'm very dry and I have dry skin and I'm not secreting as much, I could actually touch a clean, smooth surface and still not leave a fingerprint behind. Or I could be extra sweaty. I could be nervous and sweating profusely. And it could actually still obliterate the print so you could see me touch the surface. They could come back with powder and it would just be a black blob of fingerprint powder collecting because I'm overly moist. So it's a fine 
line of chance to how um, touching objects, obviously the smoother the object is, the better chance you have of getting a latent print off that object. If it's been sitting out in the weather, um, if it's rusted or it's highly textured, you're going to have a lot harder chance of getting um, a fingerprint off that surface just due to the texture or the heat. There's uh, many factors that could um, uh, allow a fingerprint to be left or not left at a scene. Were you requested to analyze multiple latents that were lifted by Rachel Peavy, I think her, she's now Rachel Kinsey, in the Cloud9 shooting case? Yes, I did. Okay. <coughs> Ms. Nader, I'm showing you what's already been admitted to evidence as State 17. Do you recognize this package? Uh, yes, I do. And what do you recognize it to be? I recognize it as um, the uh, envelope of the latents, which would be for our case number, uh, 2015 um, It would be our item number 71 that was lifted by Rachel PV, who is now Kinsey. Okay. And would those be all the latents uh, recovered that were submitted to you for analysis in this uh, case? Yes, ma'am. To my knowledge, yes. And did you review all the cards that are contained in that package? Uh, yes, I did. Okay. Can you open the package and pull the cards out, please? Does each card contain one latent or multiple latents? Or does it vary between the cards? There are... There are multiple latent lifts okay. to it. Can you just pick one and pick it up and kind of show the jury like what you're looking at and describe what's on the front of the card? Okay, basically this would be where Rachel would have used a latent fingerprint card. It's a special type of card that's coded to handle the specific latent print tape and the powder that she used because she black powdered. Um, the items in this case were processed with black powder. Um, so she's actually... Uh, this would be off the front of the cell phone where she draw, drew her sketch um, and then she would have lifted off that cell phone and then applied the tape onto the latent lift card um, and I would have analyzed it and determined it to be of no value. And that's the NV where we distinguish our notes that it's no value. On the back of each one of those cars, does it indicate where that latent was lifted from? Yes, the crime scene text will always fill out the back to indicate exactly where it's, it's taken from okay. each lift. Now, you pulled up one and indicated that a cell phone was processed. Correct. What are all the rest of the cards indicate uh, that they're from? The other cards were all off casings. They were all off the casings. Okay. And what were your results for all of those cards contained in that package? I determined them all to be of no value, where, again, I would have wrote in blue and noted NV that each one of them would have been analyzed under a four-and-a-half-powered magnifying glass looking for that skin ridge detail, and I noted that they were all no value. Okay. And when you say no value, what, what is meant to be concluded from that? In my opinion, based on that skin friction ridge analysis and the way our skin works with fingerprints or footprints, when we're touching objects, again, there was just not enough ridge detail or information left on those objects for me to even determine an identity or to exclude anybody in this case. So therefore, I would call it no value. Have you, prior to this particular case, analyzed latents that were indicated that they were lifting, lifted from casings? <coughs> yes, I have. And do you have any idea how many times you've done that? I have done it several hundreds of times in our casework. That's what I do every day, 40 hours a week, Monday through Friday. Um, it's very difficult to get fingerprints off casings. It's not impossible, but it's, it's very, very hard to get a fingerprint off a casing that you could actually ID somebody to it, in my opinion. Any particular reason why? I believe the reason why, in my opinion, is obviously when uh, firearms are loaded um, and then it's um, shot, it goes through the chamber and is under extreme heat and tumbling. And due to that factor with firearms, you're getting that heat. And again, uh, 
it, it's probably burning off that moisture that is needed for when processing comes back. There's just not enough. It dries out and there is nothing to lift. The residue is, is gone. Thank you. No further questions. Not the one. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Ms. Nader, when, when you begin your work, you look for ridges and swirls, and are those the designs that are contained in the little lifts and valleys in our fingerprints? Yes, what we're looking for, what, what um, Ms. Hawthorne is referring to is we're looking for fingerprint patterns. So we have like double loop whorls, um, we have arches, we have pattern types. And so within that, you have a certain arrangement that is unique to you. And she is talking about the ending ridges and the bifurcations and the enclosures. These are all terms that we're using um, that we're looking for to see if we can find a fingerprint pattern or if there's enough minutia, ending ridges um, to distinguish an identity or exclude somebody from the latent lifts in, in the work, which we would refer to if we had enough of that we would say the latent would be a value. If we're lacking the minutia and the ending ridges and the bifurcations and the cores and the fingerprint patterns, often we don't have enough information there. So we would say it's no value because we can't determine an identity. What's a smudge? A smudge could just be a lot of sweat and it could just smudge out and be collected. There's no ridge detail at all in a smudge. Now, when you're looking for um, the patterns, how many in your science and training have you been taught that you need to find before you can make a proper qualified identification? Well, there in the United States, what she's asking is how many points, how many of these ending ridges and bifurcations do we need in our work to determine an identity or um, an exclusion to somebody? Basically, in the U.S., there is no set standard of points, but generally, when we're looking at characteristics, we're just not counting the points. We're looking at the ending ridges, which is your ridgeoscopy, which is the shape of that ridge, as well as the um, poroscopy, which is also the shape of the pore structures. Um, because you could have pores that are shaped like an egg, and I could have pores that are shaped like a kidney bean sort of style shape that's going to be unique to us too. So it's not just that we count points. We don't count characteristics per se. We look at the whole totality of what is left there. And so until I see the actual latent, you could get some um, latents that you could have 14 points and that's a ton to have to actually make an identification because you're also factoring in the edgeoscopy and the poroscopy to it. So it's not just that we're counting the points, but there is no set number. It's left up to the examiner. Now, when you <coughs> have, you've told us that the cards that you reviewed were of no value. Does that mean none of them had any rich detail that you could identify? Some might have had slight detail, but the majority of them were no value and had hardly anything on them. So therefore, in all fairness, there's just, they were no value. It is what it is. So I didn't have enough to even exclude somebody, um, and I didn't have enough to identify anybody in this case. Is that because the surface area is so small that you're working with? That could be one of the issues, yes. And the fact that it went through uh, maybe tremendous amount of heat, the casings, so therefore it could have burned off as well. Thank you very much. You're welcome. No questions. So witness excuse? Yes, sir. You know that. Just, thank you. Call your next witness. Kara Plesey.
Hello. Can you introduce yourself to the jury and spell your name for the court reporter? Hi, my name is Kara Please. that's C-A-R-A-P-L-E-S-E. -E. Where are you employed? I work at a lab called Gateway Analytical outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. What is Gateway Analytical? It's a testing laboratory that does some forensic chemistry work, mostly gunshot residue and trace evidence, but we also do some work for pharmaceutical companies as well. What is your position with Gateway Analytical? I'm currently employed there as a senior scientist. How long have you been employed by Gateway Analytical? Since 2011. And since 2011, other than being a senior scientist, have you held any other positions? I have. Um, I was hired as a scientist one, promoted to a scientist two, and now a senior scientist. In your current position, what are your duties? I um, currently will assign work whenever it comes to different scientists. I'll perform um, analytical testing myself, interpret results, report results. Uh, if it's criminal, I will testify when necessary. I perform technical reviews for other scientists and help with other quality things around the lab, like writing procedures and helping with validation of instruments. Can you tell the jury about your educational background? I have a chemistry degree from LaRouche College and a Master of Science degree in Forensic Science focused in trace evidence from Virginia Commonwealth University. And what kind of training do you have apart from your educational background for the position that you hold? I was trained at Gateway Analytical for gunshot residue analysis by another trained scientist. Um, I also attend conferences for further, um, excuse me, further education, and Gateway Analytical partakes in annual proficiency testing. Have you always passed the proficiency test administered to you? I have. And how long is the training period for gunshot residue analysis? Um, there wasn't a specific length of time, but I looked at practice samples until I was comfortable and my work was monitored by another scientist and still today as normal procedure, it undergoes a data review if necessary and a technical review and quality review before the report is released. Are you published? I am published. Can you tell the jury in what fields you've been published? Um, some of the work I did as an in, in my internship was published um, in the Journal of Forensic Sciences and the Journal of Forensic Identification, and that work was done using hyperspectral imaging to visualize both fingerprints and um, blood stains on dark fabric. Are you a member of any professional societies? Yes, I am. Which ones? I'm a member of AAFS, which is the American Association of Forensic Sciences, um, MAAFS, which is the Mid-Atlantic Association of Forensic Scientists, and ASTI, which is the American Society of Trace Evidence Examiners. Is Gateway Analytics an accredited laboratory? Gateway Analytical is a, an accredited laboratory. By whom is it accredited? We have an ISO 17025 accreditation, ISO 9001, and the forensic specific one is ASCLAD Lab accredited. What does it mean for the laboratory to be accredited by those agencies? That means that auditors from those agencies came to Gateway and um, looked through things pertaining to their scope to make sure that our procedures were sound, that our use of the instrumentation was sound, that our training and everything that we're doing is up to their standards, and since we are accredited, that means that we are performing up to their standards. Have you ever performed gunshot residue analysis? Yes, I have if you know approximately how many occasions? There have been, I would guess, over 50 cases. Have you ever testified before as an expert witness? I have. In what fields? Gunshot residue, one fiber analysis case, and an unknown materials case. How many times have you testified as an expert witness regarding gunshot residue analysis? Regarding gunshot residue, I'd say um, at least 10 and perhaps a dozen. In the courts of what states have you testified? I've testified before in Florida, New York, and Maryland. Have you ever been asked to render an opinion in the field of gunshot residue analysis and not been permitted to do so? No, I have not. This time I would tend to the witness for cross-examination regarding the qualifications to render an opinion in that field. No question. <coughs> no question. No question. No question. No question. No question. No question. Please, what is gunshot residue? The gunshot residue particles that I'm looking for come from the firing of a firearm. So what I'm looking for specifically are the metallic or inorganic particles that come from the primer in the bullet. So whenever you fire a weapon, the firing pin hits the primer cap in a bullet and that starts a small explosion which will propel the bullet from the gun. So I'm looking for particles composed of the elements lead, barium, and antimony. 
the most specific gunshot residue particles, which we call characteristic particles, have all three elements combined into one particle. The next less specific particle are called consistent particles, and these have two of those three elements. And the last category are called commonly associated particles, and these just have one of those three elements. So what happens whenever you fire a gun is that that initial explosion causes very high temperatures to vaporize those metallic pieces that are there. So the lead, barium, and antimony originally starts as lead stiffnate as the primary explosive, barium nitrate as the oxidizer to the reaction, and antimony sulfide as the fuel for that reaction. Whenever the reaction occurs, the high temperatures cause those particles to vaporize and they're pushed from the explosion out of every opening in the gun. Once they hit the cooler atmospheric air, those particles will re-solidify, and if you have lead, barium, and antimony vapors close to each other, they will re-solidify, and that's how you get those three component particles, or single or two component combined particles, when they did not originally start that way. So those particles will be composed of those elements and they will appear molten because of the heat of the reaction. And you can think of molten as amorphous shaped, sometimes spherical. So if you think of kind of hot wax cooling again, it's not going to form a cube or a crystalline shape. It's going to be more rounded and amorphous looking. So that's what we're looking for there with the shape. How large are these particles that you're looking for? These particles can range in size. Many of them are submicron. To give you an idea of how small that is, the width of a human hair is usually between 70 and 100 microns. So these submicron particles are very small. You cannot see them with the naked eye. You can have larger particles, and you can have aggregates of particles that are significantly larger. Um, some can say up to several hundred microns, but normally the ones we see range from about 10 to submicron. And how do you go about testing a sample for gunshot residue? When you receive the samples in the lab, um, they require very little preparation. The instrument that we use is called a scanning electron microscope. So I will put the samples as received into the instrument, and the instrument uses an electron beam to scan the sample, and whenever it comes across a particle, it will collect a spectrum that is preliminary data of what that particle is made out of. So we'll have an image and a spectrum. In an automated fashion, the instrument will go through the whole sample and create a list of particles that it found and what elements are present. And once that's finished, I'll go back and relocate those individual particles. So the instrument also keeps a list of coordinates so that we can go back and manually collect a spectrum from those samples. And what we're doing there is looking for a couple things. So we want to make sure that the elements that the instrument is saying is there are actually there. So we collect a longer collection time, so a better spectrum. And we also look at the shape to make sure that it has that amorphous appearance that we're looking for and that it doesn't look um, crystalline or jagged and how it should not be looking. And when you do GSR analysis, do you, do you use control samples? Yes, we do. We have three different controls that we use. One is an elemental control, this is made of copper. So the copper check, as we call it, shows that the instrument is calibrated correctly. So we'll look at the values of the copper peaks, which are specific to copper, to make sure that the instrument is correctly labeling them and that they are at the values where they should be. Next, we use a positive control, which is a sample of known gunshot residue. And this is to make sure that the instrument is functioning correctly, where it's finding the particles down to submicron in size. So this makes sure, again, that the instrument is functioning correctly and that its focus is correct and it's not missing any small particles. The third um, control that we use is called a negative control, and this is a sample much like the samples themselves, although it's just a blank adhesive. So what's used to collect the GSR residue is an adhesive tab that's touched to whatever surface you're collecting, and it's going to pick up those particles. So I have a blank adhesive in there with the samples that's analyzed to make sure that no lead barium or antimony particles are present to assure that there's no contamination. What can you say about the meaning of finding gunshot residue particles on someone's on a sample taken from someone's hands? If we do find gunshot residue, that can indicate that someone fired a gun, but it can also indicate that they were within the vicinity of a gun being fired or that they touched something with those particles on it. And my analysis cannot 
tell the likelihood of those scenarios. And if somebody similarly does not have gunshot residue on their hands, does it mean that they did not fire a firearm? It can mean that they did not fire a firearm. However, once the particles are on your hands, they can be displaced. So if somebody washes their hands, more than likely that's going to remove all those particles. And just normal movements will likely cause those particles to be lost probably within four or several hours afterwards. And you determine how likely it is that those things will occur? No, the instrument, or my analysis will just tell me if those particles are there or not. Are there source, other sources of particles that contain lead, barium, and antimony? There are other sources of these particles individually and of two component sources. There have been very few sources of all three together. However, um, these things usually also have additional elements with them that you would not expect to find in gunshot residue, and that is something that we look for during the manual relocation. I'm going to show you what's the mark that states exhibit Can you take a look at that other form and tell me if you recognize it? I do. How do you recognize it? My initials are on this, as well as the Gateway Analytical Project ID that we assigned to this case, and the sample ID, along with the initials and date that I touched this. What do you recognize that sample as being? Um, I'm sorry, our sample that, number? That, that item. What, what is that item that I handed you? This is um, a gunshot residue collection kit. Inside this envelope should be two gunshot residue stubs, which were used to collect gunshot residue from the hands of the subject. What did you do, or when did you receive that item for analysis? We received this on July 6, 2017. What do you do upon receiving it? So it's gateway and so whenever evidence comes in the door, I myself usually sign for it and it's placed in locked storage until I'm ready to analyze it. At that point, I'll open it up and document <coughs> the packaging and what's inside and then um, take the samples to the instrument for analysis. And did you do that with those samples? Yes, I did. Did you find any particles on the left hand that were consistent with gunshot residue? I did not. And how about on the right hand? On the right hand, I found one consistent particle. The particle that you found, you talked about potentially gunshot residue containing up to three elements, lead, barium, and antimony. The particle that you found on the right hand, what elements did that contain? That particle contained two elements, lead and antimony. Now, would you expect, at, at what point in time do you expect particles to begin to be lost from one hand? They can begin to be lost immediately. Um, the more movement, they will likely be lost more quickly. And a general rule of thumb in the field, although a lot of things can affect this, is that within about four hours, you might expect all those particles to be lost. But it can happen quicker, and they can also stick around longer. After eight hours, would you eight or nine hours, would you expect particle loss? If it's a living subject who's moving, you would expect particles to be lost. Now, do you have an opinion as to whether or not the particles consistent with gunshot residue contained in the sample from the right hand actually came from gunshot residue? During my analysis, I did not see any indication of this coming from another source, meaning that the morphology was correct and there were not any additional elements indicating that this might have come from a different source. And what are some other sources potentially of lead and antimony? Lead and antimony particles have been known to come from things like fishing weights, scuba diving weights, x-ray shielding, and some um, wine capping materials. Now what about <coughs> the morphology leads you to believe that the, that the particles you found are from gunshot residue as opposed to from those items? These particles, the particle, it was singular, um, appeared amorphous. So if you have an already solid object and a particle chips or breaks off of it, it probably will look different, probably jagged, and possibly not amorphous. Now, can there be single element particles present on a sample? Yes, there can. Can you explain that to the jury? 
where they come from? For a single, would that be individual particles of lead, barium, and antimony? You can find individual particles of lead, barium, and antimony. And do those factor into your conclusion? We do not report them in the conclusion because they are not as specific to gunshot residue itself. There are source, other sources of these singular particles, but we would expect to see them in a sample of gunshot residue. Do you recall whether there were any single element particles in the sample? There were. I have no further questions. Soften. Okay. No questions. Mr. Gorelli? two elements, yes. Yes. Is also one of those steel wire? Um, I believe it's it's the annealing process from steel wire, the process of annealing it. Okay. In addition to the other three that you mentioned, correct? Yes. Okay. Now, before you receive the swab, you have no ID or no understanding as to how it got to you, correct? Um, these are actually stubs, and I know who they were submitted by, and the carrier that we received it from. But you don't know the procedure that was done as to how it was taken, who was around when it was taken, the environment that it was taken in, any of those things, correct? I have an information sheet with some information, but I wasn't present during the collection. Okay. Now, from your testimony, I understand that these particles fall off means over a period of time, correct? They do. And you would expect them to fall off onto other objects, potentially? Yes. Okay. And those objects could be anything that you would touch with your hand, correctly? That's true. Okay. If you grabbed a door handle, yes. you could transfer um, submicron particles onto the door handle, correct? Yes. If you shook somebody's hand, you could transfer submicron particles to the other person's hand, correct? That's correct. And if you touched a gun, you could transfer, without having particles on your hand, the gun, the particles on the gun could transfer to your hand, correct? That's correct. And if you then proceeded to place your hands upon handcuffs, for instance, a particle could go from the gun to your hand to a handcuff, correct? There can be secondary transfer like that. And then from the handcuff, if they were placed on an individual, you could potentially go from gun to handcuff to other individuals in hand. Is that possible? It is possible. Okay. Now, typically when you're doing an analysis, there are lots of gunshot <coughs> particles, correct? I mean, I guess you've done different varying as far as the number of particles. What's the most particles that you found in this wall? Um, our procedure for gunshot residue analysis has the instrument stop if it finds 50 um, characteristic three component particles. That's just for time saving and at that point if you find 50 there's really no advantage to finding additional. I have had samples that have stopped at 50 characteristic particles. You stop the exam if you have enough or it just can't do any more analysis after that part. No, it can. It's a time saving. So once we have found 50 characteristic particles, it moves on to the next sample. Okay. And in this instance, you found one sub micron particle in this case? I can refer to my notes for the size. I'm not sure if it was sub micron. It was one consistent two component particle. Okay. With, um, and I, I believe you, you indicated that you testified previously in, in 10 cases involving gunshot residue, correct? 10 to 12? Yes. And I've asked you this question before. Um, in that instance that you testified, have you ever testified in a, in a case where there was only one particle that was consistent with gunshot res residue? Objectives to the relevance of prior findings. Council approach. In your analysis in doing tests of gunshot residue, you break that down into separate categories, correct? 
gunshot residue that is characteristic, meaning they have all three elements. And you break that analysis into gunshot residue that is consistent with um, gunshot, particles that are consistent with gunshot residue, correct? And then there is a third one, which is what? Commonly associated particles. Okay. And that is not considered consistent or characteristic, correct? Yes. And I believe you referred to a particle that only has two out of three as a less specific particle, correct? That's true. Now you were asked to perform this test in July of 2017, is that correct? Yes. And you received that prior to testing on in July of 2017. <coughs> I'm sorry, can you repeat that last part? You received the swab in July of 2017. Yes. And you tested it approximately 10 days later. Is that right? Um, I believe we received it on the 6th and it was tested on the 11th. 11 days later. Okay. Now, do you have any knowledge as to it, it was the 7th to the 17th, correct? The, the 6th to the 11th. The report was reported on the 17th. Oh, you, okay. So, you tested it on the 11th and completed your report on the 17th. Yes. So, Judge is correct. He's giving me the high five sign. It's five days, correct? Yes. All right. That's so, five days later. That's as much math as I can do. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I'm an attorney. Um, I've already messed up with the time clock. So, um, oh, five days later after you received it, right? Yes. It didn't sit in your um, evidence bulk or wherever you keep things for two years, did it? No. Do you have any knowledge as to what happened from the time that the swab was taken, approximately two years before you received it, and when you tested it? I do not know what happened to this before it came to Gateway. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Would you expect a delay in submission to affect your opinion? Uh, a delay in submission of the evidence? No. Anything else? If the evidence had been contaminated during the period of two years, would you expect that to potentially alter your examination? I don't know that I would have knowledge if it was contaminated. Right. Okay, thank you. Are you familiar with evidence tape? I am. And this is your evidence tape here? That is mine. And the other evidence tape? Does that appear to be from the sheriff? Can I have the sheriff's office with you? Um, this was received, signed, and sealed. So what evidence tape does is that if somebody broke into this, the tape would break and the seal would not be there in full, which it was. Is there a name written on the tape, the top and bottom of RPD? Yes, that's present. I have any questions. If somebody had a submicronic particle on their hand and touched the inside of that envelope and submitted a swab during the course of mail and you're receiving it, would it be potentially possible for that particle to end up on the swab and test it? I'd say that that was unlikely because the stubs, they're, they're stubs, not swabs, just for clarification, and they're in a plastic container with a lid. So they're not really easily exposed to the inside of the envelope. They're contained. If somebody touched the inside of the container that the, I keep wanting to say swab, when you say stub, okay, the stub was placed in there, and that individual that place the stub in the container had a particle, submicronic particle on his finger and it transferred into the jar. Would you expect it to be on that stub? If there was a stray particle on the inside of the container holding the stub, it is possible that it could have ended up on the stub. Done? Yes, sir. Okay. Is the witness excused? Yes, sir. All right, ma'am, you can go about your business. Thank you. Yeah. Call your next witness. Lexi's.
Bowen, please. Alexis Bowen. Scoot up and speak into the microphone. I know that you are a quiet talker there. Can you tell the jury your name and spell it for the record? Alexius Bowen, E L E X I O U S, Bowen, B O W E N. Mr. Bowen, how are you currently employed? FedEx. What do you do for FedEx? Packaging. Okay. And how long have you been with them? 16 months. Okay. And do you also have a business as a photographer? And what types of events are you paid to photograph? Parties, clothes, whatever. Okay. And what do you do when you are paid to photograph these type of events? Just take pictures. Do you charge for the pictures? Yeah. Are you able to print out or give copies uh, to the people that you photograph at these events? Yeah. Mr. Bowen, have you ever been convicted of a felony? Yes. How many times? Three. Have you ever been convicted of a misdemeanor involving a false statement or dishonesty? Yes. How many times? Two. Okay. Did you provide photography or what's sometimes referred to this in this investigation of photo booth at the Cloud Nine Club for an event held there on September 12th going into the early morning of September 13th, 2015? How was that event arranged with, with you in order to set up there and photograph? With the... Speak up a little bit, please. With the promoter and the club. So, I guess I have to do. Okay. Do you get paid just for attending the event, or do you only get paid if people buy pictures? Where in Cloud Nine did you set up your area where you were going to take photographs? Um, by the office. Like so, you walk in to the left between the bit, <coughs> excuse me, between the um, two VIP areas. It's a big open. Okay. So is it more towards the front of the club? Yes, ma'am. Okay. On the left side, you were saying, if you're walking inside. Yeah. How much did you charge for photographs that evening? Ten a picture. Okay. You know or are familiar with a person by the name of Benitria Robinson? No other. Okay. Did, was she there that night? Yes. Did you take her photograph that night? Yes. Do you know or are you familiar with a person with the name Laquan Barra? Never knew him until that night. Okay. And did you take his photo that night? Yes. Do you see him in the courtroom today? Okay. Can you describe something that he's wearing? Stipulate to my reputation. Mark for identification of states HH. Do you recognize this CD? Yes, ma'am. What does it contain? Photos from that night. Okay. And have you reviewed the contents of this CD? Yes, ma'am. How do you know that? Same. Okay. Showing you states composite II 1 and 2. Do you recognize these two photographs? Yes. And what are they photographs of? One of Ms. Robinson and the other one of Mr. Barrett. And are these the photographs contained on the same CD? Yes. 
and these were photographs that you took when you photographed the event on the occasion that we talked about, September 12th and into September 13th, 2015. At this time, the state would move into evidence states HH as 35 and composite II as 36 A and B. No objection. No States Exhibit HH for identification will be received in evidence as States Exhibit 35. States Composite Exhibit II for identification will be received in evidence as States Exhibits 36A and B. Permission to publish to the jury 36A and B? Yes, ma'am. Bowen, that evening when where you were set up in Cloud Nine, did you were you able to observe any fights that may have happened inside? Yeah, from a distance. Okay. Were you able to observe who may have been involved in any of these fights? Yes. And who did you recognize? Miss um, Kendrick and Maisha. From where you were in the club, did you ever hear any gunshots? Okay. Eventually, when you were there, did the lights get turned on? Where were you? Were you inside when law enforcement came inside the club? Mr. Bankowitz? Yes, sir. Do you know Gary King? Gentleman, see you in a blue shirt. Remember taking any pictures of him that night? Remember seeing him at the club at all? Thank you. Thank you. The club pretty crowded that night? Yes, sir. Okay. Very crowded. Line outside, people waiting to get in? I wouldn't know about outside. Inside? Inside. Okay. Uh, how many photos do you think? Just to an estimate as to how many that you took that night. And you would agree with me, would you not, that in taking those photos, people are posing in different positions for those photos. Some people are on the ground, some people are in groups, some people are making rapper signs, those kind of things, right? Yeah. Okay, all right. Correct? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Anything else? No, sir. So witness excused? Yes, sir. All right, so you can go about your business. Call your next witness. State calls Anthony Pastorino. Council yeah. approach while the witness is coming in. Tell the jury your name and spell it for our court report. Anthony Pastorino, P-A-S-T-O-R-I-N-O. Mr. Pastorino, how are you employed? Right now, I'm unemployed. Um, what was your former occupation? I was the owner of Cloud9. When did Cloud9 open? Cloud9 opened approximately seven years ago, eight years ago. When did Cloud9 close? Two years ago. And I want to direct your attention back to September 13th of 2015. There was a shooting at your club that night. Is that I'm correct? I'm aware of that. Now, were you yourself at Cloud9 on that night? No. And did you have somebody you had hired to kind of assist running the club or manage? The manager was there. She's been employed in the club for about five years. Now, were you generally aware, even if you were not present, of the goings on at the club? Yes. What did, did Cloud Nine have something called promoters nights? Yes. Tell the jury what a, was there a promoters night on September thirteenth. I believe that was. 
Tell the jury what a promoter's night is and how it works. A promoter's night is when the club does not advertise or foster uh, the evening. There are people in the community who have a following and they do the advertising and the promoting for that evening. And people that, and do they, does the promoter then pay the club to kind of host that? The, the promoter gives the club a percentage of the door, uh, usually applied towards the security. Now, did Cloud9 employ armed security on a regular basis? Not on a regular basis, but on a sporadic basis. If you had um, armed security, where would they be hired from? I couldn't answer that question. Wendy did the hiring. Uh, we often had um, the Sheriff's Department provide uh, deputies. That was one place. The other place was an agency out of Gainesville. But you would actually use a, a agency that then, that then provided employees who were armed as opposed to simply arming your own employees? Yes. Did Cloud9 have a video surveillance system? Yes. When did you obtain that? When the club first opened, it was installed before the club was open. Before Cloud9 was Cloud9 the nightclub, what was it? It was a billiard parlor. Did you own that? I did. Did you then convert it to a nightclub? I did. And do you remember what you paid for your camera system? I don't. You trade it for something, trade something for it. Actually, I traded the installation of the camera system uh, to someone I had met while the club uh, was being built. What did you trade in to get the camera system installed? A uh, pool table from the existing billiard parlor. Were the outdoor cameras at the club functional? All of them were functional except two. One was removed and the other was non-functional. The one that faced the south parking lot, was that functional? That was not functional. Was there a camera in the doorway that was functional? Yes. Could, were you able to access recordings made on the surveillance system? We could, we, we could access the surveillance system in real time. It was kind of complicated to access it uh, to get past results up. We were not able to do that successfully. We used the IT uh, company to do that for us. And um, did the IT company, do you know that kind of through a particular person who owns the company or works Yeah, there? Adam. And what's Adam's last name? Dawkins. And does, is Mr. Dawkins the only one that was able to pull up past footage? He's the only one that ever showed up, yes. So other than being able to view footage in real time, go back and look at things that have already happened. No. Pastor, I want to go ahead and show you four photographs. Tell me if you recognize what is depicted in these photographs. This looks like the south side of the building. The stainless steel archway. There's two holes here. With the same two holes are marked. This looks like a close-up of the first hole, and that looks like a close-up of the second hole. Eight. Were you familiar generally with the appearance of your club on the outside? Yes. Before September 13, 2015, do you recall seeing those holes there? No. Do you remember there being any, any holes in that corner? No. Thank you. 
Oh, Your Honor. Yes. I have no further questions. Yes. Ms. Hoffman. September of 2015, Wendy was your manager? Yes. And um, would she arrange for security for these promoter nights? Yes. And so she had all that responsibility that evening? Yes. Do you know how many security personnel were on duty that night? Should have been 10. And were these armed or unarmed personnel? Unarmed. And were they paid by your company or Cloud Nine to yes. that promotion? Say it again? Well, let me just ask you this way. Were they hired from a private company? No. Or did Wendy bring them in? Hired by Wendy. Okay. And um, I believe you mentioned that there was a camera over the front door that yes. was operational? Yes. Okay. The camera in the south parking lot was not operational? No. And then where was the other camera that was removed? It was on a utility pole in the back of the building. By near the back door? Uh, no, maybe 50 feet from the back door, okay. facing and, the building. And um, on this evening, did um, did you later determine that the camera over the, the front door was operational? It's always been operational to my knowledge. Okay. Maybe I misunderstood. Mr. McCourt was asking you about reviewing videotapes or a tape of goings on, like if you were there at midnight and wanted to review the tape at 9 p.m., would you be able to do that? No. Would anybody be able to do that? Yes. And that was Mr. Dawkins? Yes. Okay. I mean, it's feasibly possible to do it if you know how. It was a very complicated situation, and many times we had to call Adam uh, to review the tape for us. Okay. And did you call Adam um, to help get that tape? I did not. Who, who contacted Wendy Adam? must have handled it. Okay. Did you have any conversations with him afterwards? I don't believe I did. Okay. Um, do you know if the tape was provided to law enforcement? I believe it was. Okay. Have you ever viewed the tape? No. And um, the club remains closed today? Yes. <coughs> Thank you, sir. No questions, Your Honor. Mr. Pastorino, is it fair to say that Wendy handled the day-to-day -day operations of the club? Yes. Okay. Um, and in those day-to-day -day operations that she handled, security was part of that, correct? Yes. She was the person that was scheduling the security individuals, and she was hiring the security yes. individuals, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. And when you said that there were 10 security guards, you said that was usually, okay? Did you have any knowledge as to the number of security guards that were there that, that Eight night? Eight to 10. Okay, and you're basing that on? Wendy. Wendy, okay. Now, um, does Wendy have the ability or the knowledge to review tapes? No. Okay, so Wendy would need Adam? Yes. Okay. Now, you weren't there that, that, that night at all? No. Okay, and had no, um, no knowledge, or, no, nothing to do with the hiring or the people that were working that night as far as security for yourself? That's correct. Okay. And do you have any independent knowledge as to whether any of these individuals own guns that were security no. working for you tonight? And likewise, if you don't have any independent as to whether they own guns, do you have any independent knowledge as to whether they brought a gun with them that evening, other than your policy? I wasn't there that evening. Okay. Our security people are not on. Okay. And that is a policy of the club, correct? Yes. Okay. And Wendy would be the person that would be enforcing that policy, correct? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Redirect? Yes, sir. Some witness excused. I'd ask you to remain out back for a few minutes. All right. Stand by, sir. And let me know. But you can step down. Call your next witness. State would call Adam Dawkins.
services as well as all the point of sale services. When you say point of sale, what does that mean? The touch screens that you would use in order to enter orders for the drinks. Cash registers, that type of thing? That is correct. And beyond that, was there any other types of um, services you provided? Yeah, in order to keep them PCI compliant, any network items that were attached to the network was also, uh, we helped them handle that responsibility as well. What compliant? Uh, PCI, it's a DSS, it's for the credit card industry to make sure that they stay within compliancy for keeping uh, cardholder information secure. Are you familiar with their camera system? Yes, I am. How do you, how did you first learn about their camera system? Um, their camera system is connected to the network, so when I came on board with them, we ended up helping them and handling that for them. Um, was that installed prior to the time you began working with Cloud9? Yes, it was. Um, were, any, were there any outside cameras that were no longer functioning? Uh, yes, that's correct. Um, where did the, was that the camera that faced the south parking lot? Uh, yes, there were two of them, I believe, that still were not working. Uh, there were ones that, one in the back and one that faced the parking lot area. Was there a camera over the entrance way door? Yes, there was. Was that functional? Yes, it was. I want to ask you a little bit about their DVR system, or digital recording system. Um, are you familiar with that? Yes. How did it work? Um, well, it had, the cameras all came into the one system, and then it had a recording uh, hard drive on it that would record all the information. It allowed you to do a playback on it. Um, did the, was the video that it recorded accurate video? Uh, yeah. And who would be able to access the video in the recorder to do playback? Um, to do playback, uh, basically they would go through me to help them with that. Uh, we've attempted to try and give them the information, but we always assist them directly. The zipper accessing recordings, does it require a username? It does. Does it require a password? Yes, it does. Who created the username? I did. Password? Yep, I did. Can you edit or delete any video without the password? No. <clears throat> Mr. Dawkins, I want you to go ahead and take a look at these two things. You recognize them? Yes. Okay, what are they? They are uh, video surveillance of uh, the nightclub that you had me previously view and then put my signature on. And there are two discs there. Yes. Does one disc contain, I would now be referring to exhibit KK, it was about seven separate short clips. I believe so. And in exhibit JJ, does that contain all the clips running back to that? Yes. Were you able to provide, let me ask this, um, were you able to provide the Marion County Sheriff's Office Detective Don with access to or be able to show him this footage? Yes. Were you able to burn it directly onto a CD for him or did he have to use a cell phone to record it? I believe we attempted to burn it to CD but if that function wasn't working, I do know that he did take a copy of the cell phone. Now, do those videos contain a time stamp? Uh, yeah, I believe they do. Is that for January 1st of 2000? Yes, I believe so. Now, the, the time depicted on that video, was that at approximately 1.30 in the morning on September 13, 2015? I believe so. And how was it that you were able to find the video for that time? Um, well, basically we went through and just kind of backed it up based on the time of what we were currently at. We just counted it backwards to see what time it would have been at that point in time. So if you were looking back three days, you would go, you would maybe be at January 3rd, 2000, you would back up three days to January 3rd. That is correct. Now, 
do those CDs contain accurate reflections of the video that you allow Detective Dot to view? Yes. Did they? <coughs> At this time, the state will move state's exhibits JJ and KK and the evidence of state's exhibits 36 and 37. Yes, sir. Sir, these are timestamped January 1st, 2000, and we're dealing with an incident that happened in 2013. What, what's the difference? Why would they timestamp 2000? Uh, the DVR, uh, if I'm not mistaken, anytime it got unplugged, it would, you know, the date would never come back properly on it. So, you know, that was the date stamp that it just had on it. So you're telling us that the date stamp doesn't mean anything? No, it doesn't mean anything. It's just, uh, it could be programmed for any date stamp that you would want on it. I just believe in this case, when it got unplugged at some point in time, the date stamp was never reset. So you could put any date stamp in here that you or the detective wanted, basically? Only if it was done prior. It can't be done after. That's all I have, Judge. Really? No, Judge. Right. You have an objection? No, sir. Thank you. No, sir. State's Exhibit JJ for identification will be received in evidence as State's Exhibit 37. State's Exhibit KK for identification will be received in evidence as State's Exhibit 38. Mr. Dawkins, when viewing these videos, there's actually a date stamp at the top and one at the bottom. Is that correct? Uh, I believe so. And the one at the bottom, there are actually portions of this surveillance video that's paused, and that clock will actually stand still. Is that correct? That is correct. But the one on top will continue running. That is correct. And based on that, you can say that, that if, say, the, the timestamp on the video is January 1st, 2000 at, say, 12.01, January 1st, 2000 at 12.02 on the video would be one minute later. That is correct. Can I publish the
state has no further functions. Is that a continuous feed? Uh, yes, it is. Okay. Did you prepare that? Um, well, somebody recorded it, but I was the one handling the controls on the test. Okay. And um, do you know the actual time that that tape began and when it ended? Uh, you mean how, how long the, the whole thing was or just the portion we watched? The, well, okay. Let's break it into two questions then. Sure. How long was the entire tape that you uh, The recordings usually hold for about three days. Okay. This particular recording was not three days. The one we saw on the inbound. Okay. How long was it? Approximately seven minutes. Okay. And the time um, that was on there was the time that you and Mr. McCord talked about, that default time back to 2000? That is correct. The time of date that was on there was the default time on the DVR. Okay. Do you know the actual time where the tape begins and ends? Mm, not or September 15, 2015. I mean, sorry, September 13, 2015. No, I can tell you exactly. I know it started uh, the day before and it ended the day after, I think it was. I not a thousand percent. Okay. This particular portion that was just shown, mm -hmm. did you prepare it? When you say prepared, I was the one who handled the controls. Somebody else recorded. For what we just watched? That is correct. Okay. So you came to the state attorney's office and you did that, or did they give you the tape and you go to your lab? Well, let's let's, let's back up for a moment. Uh, the CD was created in the attorney's office. However, the video was created on site there at Cloud9 with the detective. Okay. Did you participate in the CD that we just watched? I... I, they okay. gave it to me to view and put my signature on it, yes. Okay. Do you, did you compare it to the, th the CD that you turned over to law enforcement? I did not. Okay. So could it have been spliced together? No. Okay. All right. Um, you can't identify anyone on that tape? Uh, I mean, I can identify some of the employees, maybe one or two, but other than that, None of the guests are patrons now. Okay. Which one of the employees can you identify? Uh, Kenny, who was the head of the security, is a bigger guy. Okay. And what what would he have looked like in that paper? He was the very large gentleman that walked in through the end of it. Okay. And who was the other person? Um, I don't know his name, but he was also another security guard that was in there in the beginning. Okay. All right. Might that have been Wayne Council? Yeah, possibility. Okay. All right. You don't know the young man that was in the... the Top T-shirt and the shorts that was trying to get in, and, no and then left, went to the left to exit. You don't know him. No. You don't see him in the courtroom. Uh, no, it's hard to tell. His hair was longer. These gentlemen all have short hair. Okay. Thank you. Okay, the security guards depicted on the video are they your security guards? The clubs, or were these the hired people that you talked about? Uh, they they worked for Cloud Nine, to my understanding. I don't know what the arrangement was, but I do know that they handled the security for Cloud Nine. And Mr. Council was one of your security people, then. You're saying mine? No, I, had, I didn't have any security people there. I did not work for Cloud Nine. I'm sorry. Party. They were Cloud. He was Cloud Nine security. I believe so. Again, I don't know what arrangement he had, but I know he was handling the security for them. Thank you, sir. Um, the security camera that is on the outside. Yeah. That is non-functional. Correct. Was it only non-functional on September 13th? No, no it had been non-functional for about maybe two years prior. Okay. How long did you service that account? Um, I think we picked the account up in either 2010 or 2011. I'm okay. not positive of the date. Until? Until they closed. Until they closed. And did they pay you for that, that service contract? They did. And as part of that service contract, does that not maintain the camera? It is not. No, my job was to maintain to make sure that everything on the network was within PCI compliance. Did you ever suggest to them that it uh, that they should pay you to upgrade their camera or get a new camera? Uh, we have made the suggestion of getting a new camera out there. Okay. Fell on deaf ears? Uh, yes and no. Uh, their concerns on that were, uh, you know, the damage uh, in getting up there because the building was fragile at the time. 
And I know that once or twice it passed through different managers they had there. So I'm not understanding your answer. They, uh, the, the danger of getting up there. Yeah, yeah. The, climbing a ladder? Yeah, you're getting, you're getting up on a ladder or whatever it is. They, the, something about the wiring up there or whatever had to be redone for them. So. Are you scared of heights? No. Okay. Wouldn't it be you climbing the ladder to install it? No, it was going to be their own people. Now, the non-functionability of this camera, um, do we know why it was non-functional? No. Was, uh, did you yourself do any type of um, examination of that camera to determine if, in fact, maybe it was functional and the fact that it just was not feeding to the larger computer? Um, no, I did not. Do you know if anybody did or asked you to? No. Thank you. Ms. Hawthorne was asking about giving a CD to the detective. You said the detective filmed it on his phone because he was unable. The CD burning function did not work. That is correct. And anything else? No, sir. No, sir. Okay. What? Excuse? Yes, sir. You uh, I would like to keep a mic in your hand, please. Okay. I'm sorry. Do I go? Well, you're still under subpoena. I'm sorry. Okay. Subject to being called. Oh, okay. But you can leave the courthouse today. He's good to leave today. Okay. All right. Mr. Pastor, I'm going to leave as well. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, we reached a reasonable point to take our mid afternoon break. Uh, close your pads, leave all your chairs. This will be approximately 15 minutes. in recess for approximately 15 minutes. <coughs> in this case from the 4th District Court of Appeals, the, the issue on appeal before the court in this case was whether or not there was sufficient evidence introduced to sustain a violation of, a finding of violation of probation. However, part of that discussion was whether the Te the testimony of an eyewitness to a newly charged offense alleged to have been committed by the defendant was properly admitted. In that case, the person making the identification said because a long time had passed and he had used marijuana in the meantime, um, he did not recall identifying the defendant on the day of the incident. Um, he, the officer testified that he identified him as the perpetrator during a show-up and that he gave a written statement identifying him as the perpetrator. The court cites to Stanford versus State, 576 Southern 2nd, 737, noting that both the testimony of the person having made the identification and the witness who were present when the identification were made are admissible, and that such statements bear the remark of reliability because they are usually made in close temporal proximity to the actual event while the witness's visual memory of the event is fresh. Mr. Bartley is alleged to have made his identification on September 17th. This event is alleged to have occurred on September 13th. In the court held in that case, the trial court was correct in admitting the testimony of the officer that the witness in that case made a prior out-of-court statement, verbal and written, identifying the defendant as the perpetrator. <coughs> the next case I would provide to the court that may address the issue of whether the state needs to be sworn as Henry versus state. Down at 383, the Southern Second Reporter, page 320. In the Henry case, the 12-year-old the girl was sexually battered on October 3, 1976. The opinion notes that two months later, she saw the defendant walking down the street and identified him as her assailant. Over objection at trial, the mother and the father of the victim were permitted to testify to certain statements. The father was allowed to testify that his daughter's identification of the defendant, uh, allowed to testify to the identification when, the, um, when they passed him on the street two months after the incident. The victim was present at that trial and testified to both the attack and her subsequent identification. In the court, the Fifth District Court of Appeals held that the testimony of the father, which the defendant or appellant contended was hearsay, was identification of the defendant in his presence and such testimony of a person who witnesses uh, extrajudicial identification is admissible when the victim is present, testifies at trial, 
and is subject to cross-examination by the accused. I would also provide Brown versus State, found at 413, other Southern Second Reporter, page 414. This case, Your Honor, was also issued by the Fifth District Court of Appeal. In Brown, a gentleman named Mr. Boatman identified the, and this deals with whether or not, even if somebody does not identify the defendant in court, the identification is still admissible. Mr. Boatman, in this case, identified the defendant as the person who committed the burglary initially. Um, at trial, uh, he denied that the defendant committed the burglary, but admitted he had identified him from a group of photographs for police officers. Um, and he, but he later signed an uh, uh, affidavit recanting his prior identification. Um, the court held that his identification of Mr. Brown, the defendant, would be admissible, even though he might, even though the, the wife's in that case may not have been. Uh, the court notes that under the new evidence code, it does not matter if the witness testifying admits or denies or fails to recall making the prior identification. And <clears throat> the court noted that the uh, jury was able to consider and weigh that evidence in reaching their verdict. I would also tender to the court State versus Freeber, found at 366 of the Southern Second Reporter, page 426, is issued by the Florida Supreme Court in 1978. I would note that the case I just cited to Brown versus State notes that Freeber is a pre-evidence code case and that, that Freeber's holding is limited insofar as under the evidence code it does not make a difference whether they admit, deny, or fail to recall making the prior identification, but Freeber does discuss and stand for the point of law that prior identifications are nonetheless admissible in evidence. <clears throat> I would also cite your honor to Gerard versus the United States. I'm sorry, United States versus Gerard. It's a federal case from the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, found at volume 754 of the Federal Second Reporter, page 1451. It was issued in 1985. In Gerard, the, the witness identified the defendant in a photo lineup after the crime was committed. At trial, denied making any such identification. The court held that an FBI agent could testify at trial the witness had made the pretrial identification. Uh, tender copies of those cases to this case to defense counsel and to the court. And I'm, the last case I'll provide to the court and to defense counsel is Polite versus State. This is found at 41 Southern, Sur Southern 3rd, 935 of the Southern, volume 41 of the Southern 3rd Reporter, page 935. It was issued by the Fifth District Court of Appeals in 2010. Um, I'm also providing a copy of a case that was decided after that by the Florida Supreme Court, which quashed the decision in the 2010 Polite case of the Fifth District Court of Appeals, but it, that quashing pertained to the whether or not something could properly be admitted as a past recollection recorded. I would note for the court that in Earhart on Evidence, the 2017 edition at section 801.9, uh, I believe this would be footnote, uh, footnote two, Earhart does cite to this case for the proposition that the state's cross the, the direct examination of the witness in this case was sufficient to allow for a meaningful cross examination on the topic of the prior <coughs> identification. In this case, the state questioned the identifying witness and asked whether she identified the person she had previously identified the person. <coughs> who had done this to her and whether she told the police the name of the person. 
who had done this to her. And that was sufficient to open the door to cross-examination, even though she did not acknowledge identifying him to the police in response to the state's questions. They noted that her acknowledgement was not necessary for the admission of the evidence under 90.801-2C. Response. Okay, now open the floor here. Ms. Hawthorne. Well, not feeling any ambush here, Judge. Um, I. Oh no, this was discussed. We we have yes. gotten the Brady material, and um, we have not had an opportunity to have a second uh, deposition of this witness. Um, we haven't been able to talk to the witness, um, but that being said, I'm still reviewing the case law, and I have not had time to research it. So. Mr. Bankowitz? I'm in agreement with Ms. Hawthorne, although this particular witness, as far as the identification goes, isn't specific as to my client and his testimony deals with Mr. Barrow, basically. Mr. Worley? In that regard, um, I had an issue with the reliability of the other um, identification. Um, Which other identification? The photo lineup identification. Okay. Mr. Bartley apparently told Mr. Um, McCourt that he was under the influence of morphine and oxycodone at the time that he um, rendered the identification. Does that affect its admissibility? I agree well, it would have some impact on the weight of it, that's for certain. I understand that, and also I have not heard whether or not this identification was under oath or not at the time that that he made. Well, the, the case that I had begun reading this morning in anticipation of something like this occurring, uh, although this is obviously a subject that would have been better suited for a pretrial hearing, uh, is Ibar versus State, which is an opinion of the Florida Supreme Court at 938 Southern 2nd 451. Uh, Ibar has a very detailed differentiation between the, a statement of identification by a victim or a witness to a crime versus a person who is identifying someone from a photograph or that is unrelated to the commission of an offense. Uh, and Ibar the, the oath issue came up in my cursory reading of Ibar because the Supreme Court held that the testimony, the prior identification could be admissible if I get to the right, as an prior inconsistent that would require a note, and specifically uh, 9801-2A, to reading a statement is not hearsay if the declarant testifies at the trial or hearing and is subject to cross-examination concerning the statement, and the statement is A, inconsistent with the declarant's testimony and was given under a subject to the penalty of perjury at the trial, hearing, or other proceeding or in a deposition. So that, that's where the oath came up in IBAR because the, the identifications the state in that case was seeking to introduce were identifications of persons who were not witnesses to the crime, nor victims. They had, for instance, looked at a surveillance picture and said, I know who that is. Uh, the analysis of the prior statement of identification does not require that the witness in court, provided they're in court, subject to testifying, 
that they own the prior statement, refute the prior statement. It's how they testify in court is irrelevant to the admissibility of the prior identification. Now, of course, it may impact the credibility of it, but it does not affect the admissibility. Uh, but what I am going to order is that this testimony be proffered, given the fact that nobody's heard what he's going to say now, and he may some to say something different than he said to you on the telephone. So I don't want to hear about him until we've had an opportunity to fully proffer the testimony. And my intention, Your Honor, would be to call Mr. Bernie next, Detective Scala, as to his lineup, and then Mr. Bernie. Okay. Now, is there any issue with Mr. Bernie? No, sir. He has been consistent as identifying Mr. Barrow. Okay. And Mr. Bernie is a witness to the event? Yes, sir. Okay. As opposed to somebody looking at a picture? Correct. All right. And there's a gentleman in custody named Christopher Jones who also made identifications that we would seek to do what we're looking to do with Mr. Bartley's testimony. Okay. Um, when would that occur? Uh, after Mr. Bartley. I don't know if it would be immediately after. We have other witnesses who we were hoping to get through today. Mr. Okay. Jones, we can have back tomorrow morning because he's in jail. Actually, in prison. All right. But he's here. Well, let's start with the one that you're fairly certain is not going to present an issue. Let's return the juries, please. leads me to believe that I'm probably going to have to ask you to step out of the courtroom again this afternoon, uh, perhaps as soon as after the next witness. So, call your next witness. State calls Arthur Bernie. Sir, do you live here in Ocala? Yes, sir. Right. Uh, what part of Ocala do you live in? Pine Side, bud. Um, on September 13, 2015, were you at the Cloud Nine nightclub? Yes, sir. What, what brought you there that night? Um, let's go party. I ain't got tight. That's it. You said go party and... I ain't got... Mr. Barton, this lady has to take down everything you're saying, and she's having a hard time hearing you. I'm having a hard time hearing you. Would you please speak up a little bit? Well, uh, that night I wanted to go have fun, basically. How did your night end? You tell the truth, I don't remember. Were you shot? Yeah. Where were you when you were shot? Uh, like, probably by the parking lot tight on probably in the front. I told you I don't remember. I was on morphine. You were on morphine that night? Well, uh, when I went to the hospital, I lost, like, my memory, kind of. Okay. Um, that night, all you had to consume as far as intoxicants was liquor, is that correct? Yes. And when you went to the hospital later, they gave you something for the pain. All right. Go ahead and look at this diagram here. Can you tell us where you were when you were shot? Probably some up. Been done. Probably. So this is the front door here? Mm -hmm. So yes? Yes, sir. So if you were looking at the front door from the road, you're a little bit to the right across the sidewalk? Yes, sir. And kind of to the right or a little below the red walkway that comes out of the door. Yes, sir. What were you doing when you were shot? Uh, well, leave. What were you doing when you were in the nightclub that night? Let me ask you this. Do you know anybody named Laquan Barra? No. Okay. Do you know of him? Do you know who Laquan Barrow is? No? You ain't got to answer out loud. Well, I seen him like on the news, but I don't know him. See him on the news, like the TV news? Okay. Do you know somebody named Gary King? Uh, no? You gotta say yes and no, Mr. Bartley. No, sir. Okay. Do you know somebody named Michael Eugene Smith? No, sir. Okay. Do you know somebody named Nathaniel Kendrick? No, sir. 
sir. You know somebody named Danielle Kendrick? No, sir. Do you know anybody named Maisha Barrow? No, sir. <clears throat> what was going on when you were in front of the club? Like, heard a lot of arguing and talking and yelling. By that time, I was trying to, like, get from around it. But then, that was it. Did you hear anything? My life by like some gunshots. How many gunshots you think you heard? Can't remember. Were you hit with a gunshot? Yeah, at the last minute. I found out I was shot. I ain't know it. Where were you shot? My back. Do you remember? Do you know who shot you? No, sir. Do you remember on September 17, 2015, speaking with Detective Newbanks at the hospital? Yes, sir. And do you remember he showed you a series of photographs? Yes, sir. May the record reflect I'm showing the witness states exhibit MN previously shown to defense counsel. Right, Mr. Bartley, I'm going to show you what's been marked as, or marked as states exhibit MN. Can you take a look at these two things and tell me if you recognize them? You recognize these? No, sir. Okay. Is that your signature there? Yes, sir. Okay. Did, is that your handwriting there on the picture next to the left of picture number four? No? No, sir. Okay. Did you circle that? No, I don't remember. Did you write, went to shooting I've selected photo number four as the person who went to shooting as I walk off. No, sir. You didn't write that, or you don't remember writing it? I don't remember. So you may have written it, you just don't remember? All right. <coughs> Mr. Bartley, there's a gentleman over there, second from the right, wearing a black shirt. Okay? You know who I'm talking about? Between the lawyer with the white hair and the lawyer with the gray hair. Do you see him? Objection, <laughs> <laughs> At least you guys have hair. I don't know. Um, Move to strike. But, but it's in the see. eye of the beholder. Right, don't put it like this, sir. But I did do all that. I ain't know what I was doing. I just see it on the news. So I was like, y'all coming to question me why I'm in pain and all this. And I told y'all, I don't know what's happening. So y'all can't ask him, so I just want to hear a lot. So he can lock me up for so. Okay. And you selected this, you said, because you saw Laquan Barrow on the television news? All right. Okay. What was the news article about? Okay, Clyde Nile suit. What about it? What were they talking Mr. Barrow did? It was like, he had a shot. Shot at a guest, so called shot at an innocent girl, but I don't know. Okay. Well, what was the, I mean, you remember seeing him on the news, right? I mean, you remember that face, even though you're on pain and in morphine, right? Yeah. You remember him from the TV? Yes, sir. And you identify him in the lineup because you saw him on the TV? Yes, sir. What was the news article about him? About? Was it about how he got arrested? Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes, sir. Okay. And you said at the time you made this identification, you were under the influence of morphine. Yes, sir. Well, I have no further questions. Do you have any questions? No, sir. I don't have any. No, sir. No. Okay. All right. Uh, Mr. Bartley, I need you to step down for a minute. You may be coming back into the courtroom, okay? So don't go too far. Scal is going to say, because that is the evidence that's admissible, in my opinion, based on what I've heard today. Uh, the extent to which 
the witness now denies memory. You're, he's subject to being fully crossed on that issue. But the evidence of the identification, the hearsay, that is hearsay under the rule, is the testimony of Detective Scala. He knew back, Your Honor, but yes. So uh, I'm going to overrule the objection. I do find, based on my reading of IBAR, that this is exactly what the Supreme Court says, that a statement of identification made by a witness or victim to a crime is intended to address. In the event that we proceed and that is introduced, we will be objecting, Your Honor, and we will be arguing the things that we previously argued. Understood. Understood. Do you want to go forward with him now? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Let's bring him back in. Uh, let's get the jurors back in and then bring him in. or some objection, I'm going to explain to him so that he understands. We're going to go basically. Okay, we are waiting for the jury to come in. The witness on the... Speak up. Tell the jury your name. Uh, Ted Bart. Where do you live, Mr. Bartley? Bart Side Garden. You're in Ocala? Yes, sir. How long have you lived in Ocala? It's about five years. Where did you live before that? West Palm Beach. Mr. Bartley, have you ever been convicted of a felony before? Yes, sir. Is it three times? Yes, sir. Now, Mr. Bartley, on September 13, 2015, were you at the Cloud Nine nightclub? Yes, sir. Why'd you go to Cloud Nine that night? To party, have fun. Did you party? So I can. Did you have fun? Not really. Had you anything to drink that night? Yes, sir. Okay, how much did you have to drink? About a whole fifth of a bottle. Fifth of a bottle? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. All right, now, Mr. Bartley, how did your night at Cloud Nine end? Me getting shot in the hospital. When you were in the nightclub, was there a fight? No, I was in the bathroom around that time, so. Did you come aware that there was a fight? Yes, sir. Do you know who was fighting? No, sir. Do you know if it was men or women? No, sir. What happened after you came out of the bathroom? After I came out of the bathroom, everybody was in the parking lot. That's when I was escorting everybody at the club. Did you also get brought out with everybody else? Not really. Did you yourself go outside, though? Yes, sir. What happens when you get to the front of the club? When I got in the front. What's that? Arguing, when I got in front of the club, arguing escalated, so I wasn't moving, like leaving. By the time I was leaving, I heard gunshots. Now, do you know who was fighting in front of the club? No, sir. Do you know who's arguing? No, sir. Is it men or women? I don't know. Can you tell if it was a man's voice or a woman's voice? Objection, Your Honor. He's already said he didn't know who was arguing. Sustained. <clears throat> and you said that because of the argument you went to leaving? No, sir. Okay. What happened when you were leaving? No, I went to leaving. I heard gunshot. How many do you think you heard? I don't know. When, 
And you said you were shot? Yes, sir. Where were you? My back was turned. Your back was turned? I shot on my back. Did you go to run away when you heard the shots? Yes, sir. How badly were you injured, Mr. Bartley? Very bad. It went through my back and like sat on my stomach. Did you have to have surgery as a result of that? Yes, sir. What type of surgery did you have to have? A dumb surgery or something like that. I forgot. Do you know what they had to do when they were in there? Cut my stomach open to get the bullet, then they had to stitch everything back up. It pierced one of my levels. Like. Did you see anybody that night shooting a gun? No, I don't know. I really was. When I seen, I seen security guards shooting. Up. By that time, that's when I turned up. You saw security guards shooting. That's what started everything. And did you see anybody else shooting a gun? No, sir. That's why I said I kind of lied. Okay, we'll talk about that, Mr. Barley. <clears throat> there are three gentlemen over here, one in a black shirt, one in a blue shirt, one in a maroon shirt. Have you seen any of those men before? No, sir. Now, do you remember on September 17th of 2015, Detective Newbanks visited you in the hospital? I remember. Okay. Did he show you a series of photographs while he was there? Yes, sir. Also got me on tape. What's that? Got me on tape also. I had to talk on a tape recorder also. Is he made a, he, he recorded you? I said, right. All right, Mr. Bartley, I want to show you what's been marked as State's Exhibit MM. Can you take a look at this and tell me on this first page here if you recognize that page? Yes, sir. Me pointing out Laquan and also me saying I went to the club. Okay. Now, is that your signature there? Yes, sir. Is that your handwriting there? Yes, sir. Okay. Saying you selected a photograph as the person who did something? Yes, sir. Okay. And on the second page here, with the photographs, did you circle somebody? The coin was shooting in the app. By that time, I ain't seen him shoot nobody, though. Okay, so you, now you're saying Laquan was shooting in the air? Yes, sir. Okay. And you circled that picture? Yes, sir. And did you put your initials and the date on that picture? Yes, sir. And in this, you wrote, you selected him as the person who went to shooting as you walked off? Yes, sir. Does this item appear to be in the same condition as when you signed it? Yes, sir. At this time, the state removed state's exhibit M and the evidence of state's exhibit 40. Renew my previous objection, John. <laughs> Mr. Bartley, why did you select Laquan Barrow's photograph from that series of photos? For one, the news. For two, that night, when I went to turn off, it was shooting the eye. You said be one because of the news? All right. Okay. And what you have testified to previously is that you saw his picture on the news in conjunction with being arrested with the Cloud Nine nightclub shooting. All right. Okay. And that's why you selected his photograph on September 17th of 2015. Is that correct? All right. And where were you when you saw that news program about his arrest? No, I was in the hospital on my back. And you were watching on television? Yes, sir. Stop a moment. Yes, sir. I have nothing further, Your Honor. Uh, for Good afternoon, Mr. Bartley. Good afternoon. Mr. Bartley, do you know Michael Smith? No, ma'am. No, no, like that. No, ma'am. Did you 
happen to, do you happen to recall if you saw a person looking like my client at Cloud Nine on September 13th, 2015? No, 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 no. Thank you. Mr. Bankowitz. Sir, do you know Gary King? No, sir. Gentlemen, sir, you your blue shirt? Did you see him at Cloud Nine that night? I uh, know. Uh, Did you see him out in the parking lot? No, sir. Said a no. Thank you. Mr. Gorman. Thank you. Mr. Bartley, what color shirts does security wear at Cloud Nine? Black security shirt. Okay. Do you remember what Mr. Farrow was wearing that night? Probably all black, but I don't really recall. Okay. Now, you previously testified that you didn't remember anybody shooting because of being on, when, they, when you were asked, because of being on oxycodone and morphine, correct? Right. Okay. Is that true that you don't remember? It's really true, but they keep pressing me like they're doing now, so I'm telling them what they really want to hear, sir. I'm sorry. Or, I, could you repeat that answer? Basically, what I'm saying is I told them I don't remember. I told them I don't know. But they keep asking, and then at the same time, yeah, I circle this picture. Really, I lied. I ain't knew. That's what I was saying. Okay. Um, when you say they, are you referring to law enforcement? Law enforcement, investigators, all of that. Okay. You felt pressured to? Right. right. Now, when you just testified before the jury that um, Laquan was shooting into the air, did you recall that happening? Or did you offer that testimony because you felt that you were being pressured? That I was being pressured. When you initially gave your statement to the police, were you coming out of surgery? Were you going into surgery? I was just coming out. Okay. And as a result of that surgery, you were given pain medication? Yes, sir. Morphine, oxycodone? Yes, sir. In addition to the pain medication, um, I imagine from your description of the surgery that you were in serious pain. Is that accurate? Yes, sir. Okay. And when you gave this statement to the detective and you made representations, um, did the medication, the pain, and their pressure affect your statements? Yes, sir. Okay. Do you think that because of those three things, that was the reason that you gave false statements to the detective? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Redirect. Detective Newbanks never threatened you, did he? No, I ain't threatened, but he just kept asking questions without press. Okay, so he's just there asking you questions. Yeah. So because see. he's asking you questions, you feel pressure to identify somebody you saw in the news having been arrested already? Yes. Anything else? Nothing additional. Mr. Gorla? Yeah, you go. All right. Is the witness excused? Yes, sir. All right, so you can go about your business. Uh, Council of French. Call your next witness.
Have you ever uh, worked in any other capacity than Marion County Sheriff's Office? Yes. And what was that? Um, I started off in transportation at the jail, and I've also worked in major crimes investigation. Were you one of the two detectives assigned as lead investigators on the shooting in, into the homicide at the Cloud Nine nightclub? Yes. Detective, I want to ask you about something that happened on September 17th of 2015. Did you go to the Ocala Regional Medical Center that day? I did. What was the purpose of you going there? Uh, to conduct an interview with a potential eyewitness. What was that person's name? Dontarius Bartlett. Did you conduct an interview with him? I did. Did you record that interview? I did. How, obviously Mr. Bartley was in a hospital. Could you describe his mental state to the jury? Um, he appeared coherent. He uh, provided me with all of his information, answered any questions we asked him um, to the best of his knowledge. Did there come a time in your interview of him when you showed him a photographic lineup? Yes. Explain to the jury what a photographic lineup is and how they're administered. A photographic lineup uh, is essentially consists of six photographs of individuals. One individual is a suspect. The others are similar characteristics as far as race, gender. Um, they're given to the, the witness on a blank sheet of paper. We have instructions that we go over and read verbatim. Uh, when the instructions are done, the witness advises if he understands, he indicates, and then he, in this particular instance, he removed the instruction sheet and showed himself the, the photos and examined them that way. Did he select the photo from the line of you should? Yes. Let me show you what's been marked as State's Exhibit MM. Take a look at these documents and tell me if you recognize them. I do. What are they? Um, the first page is the photo array admonition form that Mr. Bartley signed and initialed, and the second is the photo lineup array with the six pictures. Did you select the photograph? Uh, he did. Who is the individual depicted in the photograph he selected? The individual depicted in photograph number four is Laquan Barra. Do you know Mr. Barra? Um, working this case, yes. <laughs> Can you, you see him here in court? I do. Can you describe his clothing for the jury? Uh, the the All right. Then the record will reflect that he was hand identified. Mr. Barrow. And how did, what did Mr. Bartley describe and identify Mr. Barrow as having done? stated that he observed the individual that he depicted that was wearing a black t-shirt and dark colored cargo pants. Uh, he said that that individual was also had a firearm and started shooting when he was walking back towards the club. And does this item appear to be in the same condition as when we place in evidence? It does. This time the state moves state's exhibit and and the evidence that state's exhibit 41. Ms. Hoffman. No objection. No objection. Your objection is noted. It's overruled. State's Exhibit MM for identification will be received in evidence as State's Exhibit 4. September 17th. 2015? Yes, sir. What day was Mr. Barrow arrested? Um, Mr. Barrow was arrested on September 21st. Of 2015? 2015, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. So there could not have been a news program about his arrest four days before it happened? No, sir. I have no further questions. Ms. Hawthorne? No questions. No questions, Mr. Were you?
you aware that Mr. Barley just came out of surgery? Uh, yes. Yes? Yes. And you were aware that it was a pretty um, intensive surgery in yes. regards to opening up his abdomen, repairing the damage in his stomach, and or liver? Correct. No. And as a result of that operation, he was provided, obviously, due to the severity of it, pain medication, correct? I'm not a doctor, but I would assume so, yeah. Okay. Were you aware of the pain medication that he, that he was under at no, the time that he made these statements? No, sir. Okay. Would you be surprised if he was under pain medication morphine? Would I be surprised? Yeah. He was coherent. He was, morphine is commonly given to individuals that are recovering from surgery, correct? Again, I'm not a doctor. I can't answer that. Same question, Oxford. I'm assuming the same answer. Same. Now, I noticed in this um, admonition that you have here that the writing doesn't appear to be very um, clear or clean. I guess the lack of those seems to be meandering as far as the line. WE appears to be um, on the line and appears to be under the line. Um, T appears to be not completed. 2 appears to be rising upward. Objection, counsel testifying. <clears throat> Would you agree with me that the writing is almost in a illegible? I would say the penmanship isn't neat. Right. <coughs> this is if I'm understanding it correctly, went to do shooting as I walked off. Is that what you're That's, saying? Yes, sir. Initially I thought it went to plow or close, but again, please. All right, ladies and gentlemen, please step out of the courtroom. Maybe you have on your chair.
Sir, can you tell me your name? Mr. Jones, do you understand that you're under subpoena to give testimony in this proceeding? Do you receive a subpoena? Okay. Uh, that subpoena means that whatever you say here cannot be used against you to prosecute you for any sort of offense. Do you understand that? But it also means that you have to answer questions. And that if you were to refuse to answer questions after being given the subpoena, that you could be held in contempt of court. That's right. And that you could be sentenced to jail. That's right. And that's your intention? Yes. You're not going to answer anybody's questions? Not one. Not one. I told them this before they went through all that. Your Honor, the state's position would be that is that the state should be allowed to introduce evidence of a prior identification on the brought into the courtroom, and whether or not he agrees to submit to questioning, I think, does not mean that he was not subject to it. The state would request that the court. I cannot come to the conclusion that his refusal to answer questions and subjecting himself to a possible contempt citation satisfies the requirement in the evidence code that he appears and testifies at trial. Because the entire point is that he's subject to cross-examination. That's what makes the hearsay of his prior identification admissible. So in the absence of him answering some question under oath, I do not believe the out-of-court identification is admissible. Unless you show me something different. Because the evidence code clearly requires his appearance and testimony at this proceeding. Do you have anything to say on this side? You're welcome to inspect. Why is Mr. Jones in custody? He's serving a prison sentence in 2021.
Your Honor, the state would offer this argument to the court. Under Statute 90.804, subparagraph 1D, Mr. Unavailability of a witness means the declarant is unable to testify. I'm sorry, B. The witness is the declarant. Is a witness unavailable when they persist in refusing to testify concerning a subject matter of the declarant's statement despite an order of the court to do so? Under 90.804, subparagraph 2, there is a hearsay exception that the following is not excluded as evidence provided that they are unavailable. One is former testimony, which is testimony given as a witness at another hearing of the same or a different proceeding, or in a deposition taken in compliance with the law in the course of the same or another proceeding. The state's position would be that Mr. Jones' deposition testimony would constitute, because he's unavailable, his deposition testimony regarding whether or not he previously made identifications through the Marion County Sheriff's Office would be admissible to prove that he did, in fact, make prior identifications. And that if... So I'm supposed to find he's unavailable, use another out-of-court statement to satisfy the requirement that allows his other out-of-court statement to be admitted. Yes, sir. Hearsay within hearsay is admissible if each layer of the hearsay is admissible. The court were to... The statements he made at the deposition that he identified for Quan Barrow and Gary King were photographed in lineups. It was discussed. It does appear in his deposition. But it doesn't satisfy the requirement of 801, which is where the statement of identification becomes admissible. It says, appears in court and testifies. And is subject to cross-examination. And they can't cross-examine his previous deposition. And as I indicated before, the entire crux of this part of the rule is that the witness is here and subject to cross-examination. If that's the argument, I'm not going to allow the testimony. Whether there's any utility in holding him in contempt is another matter. The state's position is that there would be some utility in that given the circumstances. What was the offense that he's convicted for? Child abuse? Yes, sir. I believe he's also serving a sentence out of Alachua County. That must be the one. Turn your back here, please. Mr. Jones, raise your right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, 
the whole truth and nothing but the truth to help you go. Uh, tell me your full name. So that's not true. Do you understand, sir, that you have been served with a subpoena requiring you to give testimony in this proceeding? Do you understand that I am now ordering you to testify in this proceeding? You don't understand that? Well, I'm telling you that you have to answer the questions of the attorneys. You're refusing. Do you understand that refusing to testify after being ordered to do so by the a judge would subject you to a potential contempt citation. Well, it means I can sentence you to jail and without a jury for up to six months. Do you understand that? Okay. I'm ordering you to testify. Will you testify? Can you show me any reason why I should not hold you in contempt of court? But you don't, you can't demonstrate any reason for me not to hold you in contempt. The court finds you to be in contempt of court. You'll be sentenced to 180 days in the Marion County Jail. You're going to serve that before you return to the Department of Corrections. You're welcome. Call your next witness. State calls Davinus Blunt. Yes. <laughs> Over here. Do you swear from the testimony about to give me the truth, the whole truth, the nothing about the truth, stuff you got? Have a seat. It's Kipke. Good afternoon. Can you scoot up? You're going to speak in the microphone and speak out loud, okay? All uh, right. Okay. What's your name? Tell the jury your name. Um, Davin is blunt. And how do you spell that? It's D A V I N I S T. Okay. And how are you employed, Mr. Blunt? Uh, Budweiser, Triangle Sales. Okay. What do you do for them? Uh, warehouse operator. Okay. Team lead assistant. And how long have you worked for that company? I'm coming up on three years now. Okay. Are you married, sir? Not yet. <laughs> Are you engaged? Uh, pretty soon. Pretty soon? <laughs> Do you have any children? Yes, I got one daughter. How old is she? Two. Okay. Do you live in Ocala? Do you live in Marion County? Uh, yes, I do. How long have you lived in Marion County? Uh, all my life. I'm going to direct your attention, Mr. Blunt, to the late night that night. Yes. Why did you go to Cloud Nine that night? Uh, just to hang out, I guess. Uh, were you uh, seeing someone at the time? Uh, yes. Who were you seeing? Uh, at the time, my girlfriend, Chantel. Okay. Yeah. And did you? who did you go to the club with? Oh, that's where I went with. I mean, I just... Okay. Is she the reason why you went there? Yes. Yeah. Did you have any individual particular interest of going there that night? No, not really. Just oh. went because she wanted to go. Prior to that night, had you been to that club before? Yes, I have. Okay. Approximately how many times? Just one. <laughs> okay. Just one other previous yeah. time? Okay. Is that a yes? No, yeah, yes, ma'am. Okay. <laughs> Do you know approximately what time you got there? Around like 10, I think it was, 10, 30, something like How that. crowded was it when you got there? There wasn't nobody there when I first got okay. there. Okay. <laughs> um, what was the security like getting into the club that night? Well, there was a bunch of people standing around talking. <laughs> okay. Did you have to pass through security to enter into the club? Okay. Um, what did they do to check you to get into the club? Uh, it's just a uh, pat down and, you know, like, you know, the place. Um, did you have to show ID to get in? 
Yes, ma'am. Okay. When you got inside, where did you go? I went to the bar. I had a friend that uh, I known for a while ago. I was just sitting at the bar talking to him. Okay. Did you stay in that location the entire time that you were in, inside? Oh, no. Okay. Where, after you, you talked to your friend at the bar, where did you go inside the club? Um, the little booth that was in the corner right there, and I was just sitting there the whole night. Okay. So after you went to the booth, that's where you stayed until you left the club. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Where was that booth in relation to the front door? Uh, it's right around the corner. You just step, like, so when you walk down, you made a right, and, like, the door is right there. Okay. So you walked inside and made a right, or you walked inside and you made a left? Oh, I walked to the booth? Yes. Oh, well, to get to where I was, you got to walk in and go to the left. Okay. And that's, so you're more towards the front of the club? Yes. And that's where you stayed once you sat down there until you left? Yes? Oh, yes. <laughs> what was your girlfriend at the time doing inside? Oh, uh, walking around, and I guess associating with people that she know. Okay. okay. Did you have a view of the entire club where you were sitting? Uh, yes, I did. Okay. Was it raised in any way? Oh, yes, it was. Okay. Did you see a fight break out inside while you were sitting up there in the booth? Mm, faintly, but I don't really remember too much. Okay. Okay. How did you, how could you tell that maybe something was going on inside the club? A bunch of people crowding around, loud yelling and stuff. I knew something was going on. Could you tell or see anybody that was involved in that? No? Uh, no. Is that an no, no, Okay. Did you see what happened to that group of people? Uh, no, not really. Just like a lot of commotion and moving around and the people getting moved in different directions, but I, I really couldn't see too much of nothing. I really wasn't paying attention. Okay. <laughs> Just... What made you decide to leave? You wanted to leave? Uh, just get out of there. Just really get home. Just, just something ain't feel right. Just, okay. Just trying to get out of there. Um, were they closing the club down, t in your impression, at that point in time? Uh, yes, they were yeah, getting ready to. Okay. How? What told you they were getting ready to close the place? Well, he kind of announced it on the, on the uh, in the booth and kind of said something, and all the lights come on. And but I was trying to get out of there before that, and like, okay. you know, right trying to get out the door. That's when everything, everybody trying to get out. So. Did you look for your girlfriend? Did you look for Chantel before you left? Yes. Before you left, did you find her inside? Yes, I did. Where was she? She was coming over, I think she was over by the bar doing something, talking. Okay. Did you walk out the front door together? Yes. Okay. What happened when you got outside the front door? Uh, walked out. And then, <laughs> like I said, remember walking out, taking a couple steps, and before I know it, just, just shots ringing off. Okay. So, are you all the way out of the doorway in the front of the club when you hear shots? Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. And where was Chantel? Uh, she was right beside me. What happened when you heard that? Uh, I kind of <laughs> split ways. She kind of kind of pushed it back that way, and I took off for another direction. Okay. Where had you parked? Uh, I parked over by the uh, the little beauty place, the whatever it is, right across to the right of the club. Okay. Um, and so what direction? Did you go towards where you were parked or the other direction? I went the other direction. Okay. And Chantel went towards where you were parked? Uh, she went in the direction I kind of pushed it down. Okay. <laughs> what happened after you started running? Uh, I was running and kind of felt my leg kind of give out, you know, couldn't run no more, so I just laid there. Okay. <laughs> How far did you get? Uh, not too far. <laughs> okay. And what did you realize after you fell to the ground? Uh, something had happened. <laughs> you know, a bunch of people like, uh, like say, hollering, screaming, and stuff, and you know, rolling over and looking at you know, all this blood on my shorts, and you know, I'm like, uh, something ain't right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, did you realize you were shot? 
Yeah, when I seen the blood, I knew something. <laughs> Where were you shot, Mr. Barnett? Uh, my left leg. Okay. What part of the leg? Uh, right above my knee. Okay. And when you fell, did you stay in that location? Uh, I did until um, I could really, I guess, adjust to see what was really going on. Did people come over um, and try to help you? Uh, not till I was able to stand and call somebody. Okay. But um, I don't, ain't nobody see me over there. I was way out by myself. Ain't nobody see me. Okay. Um, so you stood back up after you fell. How far did you get after after you stood back up? Uh, I managed to like walk over by um, it was a truck park like almost by the oyster bar counter, and I managed to like stand up like by the truck. Okay. And what happened once you got over near the truck? Uh, I just called <laughs> called nine one one. Okay. So you had you had a phone on you, yeah. and you called nine one one. Okay. Did any police officers or medics or anything show up to help you out? Oh, uh, yes. What showed up first, an officer or a medic? An uh, officer did first. What happened when an officer showed up? Uh, he showed up, and I'm uh, just talking to him. Well, actually, I gave him the phone so he can talk to the operator because I didn't know a lot of stuff she was saying. And so I let him talk to her, and basically he walked me around the other side of his car. He was kind of telling me to calm down and stuff. You know, basically, that was it. Did you get transported to the hospital? Uh, yes, ma'am, I did. Okay. And once you got to the hospital, uh, did you have to have surgery or anything? No, ma'am, no surgery. How long were you in the hospital? I left early Sunday morning around about, uh, I'd say approximately between 6.30 and I think maybe 7 o'clock. So you were there about five or six hours? Yeah, ma'am. Okay. And do you have any lasting effects from being shot in your upper leg, upper left leg? Uh, I guess so. It hurts sometimes, time to time. Maybe some nerve damage. I mean, it's on the way I can, I guess. But Do you ever have to time. take anything for pain? No, man, I don't have to take anything. Okay. Oh, man. Did you see um, anybody with guns that night? As far as what you mean? Did you see anybody at the club with firearms that night? For security or anything like anybody, anybody. anybody. I remember seeing uh, I think one security. Uh, I think he had one on his hip. Okay, on his hip. You think? Um, did you see who shot you? No. Okay. <laughs> Were you running away when that happened? Yes, indeed. <laughs> Do you know somebody by the name of Benitria Robinson? Yes, I know. Did you see her at the club that night? Yes, ma'am. Did you see her? when the shooting started? Yes, I saw her. She was standing maybe a little in front of me. Okay, so she was in front of you when the shots started? Yes. Okay. And did you see her fall? Yeah, I seen her going to the ground. Like I said, when I, I seen everybody start to separate. And I just remember seeing her falling and going to the ground. Like I said, I was taking off another direction. First, I'm going to show you states one. Just watch, you got some jurors behind you, so if you'll come just right up here, right next to the side, step back a little bit. Can you show the jury where you parked? Is it on this diagram? Okay, where the club? Club's right here. <laughs> okay, I parked uh, over here in this, like in this part right there. Where okay, at. so the darker asphalt area, yeah. not the club parking lot. No, well, I was that right there. Okay, and where did you end up after you were shot when you were talking about law enforcement found you? Uh, over in this area, by okay. the sidewalk. Okay. So is it that direction that Chantel ran when the shots fired? No, well, she kind of fell back and toward the club. Okay, so she went back towards yeah. the doorway of the club. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
I'm going to show you one more thing. States 2. It's kind of overhead. This is the club right here. Where were you? Can you point on this diagram where you were when you first heard the shooting? Okay, we just coming out the door. Okay. Like, probably right, right, maybe a few steps out the door. Okay. Where did you see Benitria? Um, so she was standing in front of me, like over to the right, kind of like cattle. So on this pink part or on no, the gray part? More to the side. Oh, uh, more to yeah. the left side? Yeah. Okay. On the gray part? Is so that not that far in front of you? Yeah, she, like, she, wasn't, she wasn't far from me at all. Okay. And where did you first fall? Oh, when I hit the ground? Yes. Over, actually going toward the asphalt over to the that way. Yeah. Okay. So over here? Mm -hmm. Okay. And where did you see Benitria fall? I remember looking back, she was over in this direction. Okay. On the pink or on the gray? Uh, I'm on the gray, I think. Pink, gray. I just okay. know in that area. Okay. So she started out on the left and ended up on the right of this area. Okay. Thank you. Take your seat back. Do you know my client, Michael Smith? No, can't say that I do know Okay. Um, on September 13, 2015, did you see anyone that looked like him at the club? My client? No, not inside the building. Okay, thanks. Mr. Bankowitz. Do you know Harry King? Gentleman sitting here? No, I can't say that I do. And you remember seeing him at the club that night? No, I don't really remember seeing him. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Blood, at the time that the shots were fired, do you remember hearing or seeing anything? Just people yelling. Yeah. Remember noticing a vehicle on Pine traveling fast? I remember a lot of cars traveling fast. Okay. Yeah. You do you recall if you told the detective that when he interviewed you? Yeah, I remember hearing the car speed off. He said a bunch of cars right by. People just car scrambling everywhere. Right. Was that at the time of the shooting? It was a little short after. Okay. <coughs> During the time of the shooting, do you remember telling the detective about a car speeding? <coughs> Why? During the time of the shooting? At about the same time. law enforcement after the shooting? Right after, uh, at the hospital? Or? Yes, at the hospital. Oh yeah, I talked to a bunch of them in the hospital. <laughs> okay, okay. And did, were you given any medication or pain medication once you got to the hospital? Yes, I, <laughs> yes. Uh, do you remember everything you said that night after you were shot and went to the hospital? Okay, okay. Did you call anybody other than 911 when you were still at the scene after you had been shot? Yes. Okay, who else did you call? I called my mom. Okay. Did you recall that conversation completely? Oh, yeah, I remember that. Okay. What'd you tell your mom? I got shot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And then, it, was it only right after when you went to the hospital that you spoke with law enforcement about what had happened? Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay, so you didn't speak with them again on a later date after you got out of the hospital? No. Nothing further. Anything else? Mr. 
Mr. Blunt, you went to the hospital. You were there only a few hours? Or did you have to stay overnight? No, I didn't stay overnight. Okay. Well, you were shot in the leg? Yes. Did, um, was anything removed from your wound? No. Okay, thank you. Nothing additional, Judge. No further questions. Witness excuse? Yes, sir. Right. You know about your business, sir. Council approach. yourself to the jury and spell your name for the record. My name is Rollin Boyd. It's R-O-L-I-N-B-O-Y-D. And how are you employed? I am a firefighter, paramedic, hazardous materials technician with Marion County Fire Rescue. How long have you been with Marion County Fire Rescue? Approximately six and a half years. Okay. And has it always been in that same capacity? I started as an EMT when I first got hired. Then shortly thereafter, about eight months to a year, got moved over to the fire side and became a firefighter EMT, then went to paramedic school became a paramedic, then went to hazardous materials school and became a hazardous materials technician. Okay. And that gets you to what you're presently doing today? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And what's the difference between being an EMT and a paramedic with the fire department? EMTs are only able to do basic life support skills. Uh, paramedics do advanced life support skills, where that's intubations, uh, cardiac arrest, pushing medications, starting IVs and so on, just more of advance in the medical field than the EMT is. Okay. I'm going to direct your attention to the early morning of September 13th of 2015. Were you on duty? Yes, ma'am. And did your unit get dispatched to uh, go to the Cloud 9 nightclub in response to a shooting? Yes, ma'am. And where is your particular station? Our, our station is off of 475, approximately from Cloud 9, I would say about 10 to 12 miles away, okay. south. So you're some diff distance from that location? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And were you at the station when you were called? Yes, ma'am, I was. Okay. And and what type of vehicle did you go to uh, the Cloud Nine Club? I was on Rescue 16, which is an ambulance with Marion County Fire Rescue. I was the lead paramedic on this call. There was another paramedic on the transport unit, but we alternate calls, and it happened to be my call, that particular call. How many people other than you were in that unit? One other. Okay. So the other paramedic that you were talking about? He, was, he drove and I um, ride when it's, and we do vice versa depending on whose call it is at that, that time. Okay. So you said you're about 10 to 12 miles away. Once you got dispatched, got called to go there, how long do you think it took you to get there? Uh, approximately 10, 10 minutes. Okay. We went cold response. Had we went hot response, which that's hot is lights and sirens. A cold response is no lights and sirens, and that was due to the fact that first they were having a stage, and the staging is to sit, stay away from the scene of the incident because it's not safe, that law enforcement deems it's not safe. And so instead of stopping alongside the road, we knew the distance that it was going to take and the time frame that it was going to take. We just kept driving to the access scene. Had we went high, we could have probably been there in five to eight minutes. So was there a particular time on the way to the scene that you got the clearance? Yes. Okay, so it was declared clear before you arrived? Yes. Where do you remember uh, that your vehicle, even though you weren't driving, where, where did where'd you park? We parked in the middle of uh, South Pine or Highway 441 in the turn lane that's in between, that's in the middle lane of the four-lane four highway. Okay. Um, were there other rescue units there? There was another ambulance, yes, and then there's, I can't tell you how many Ocala Fire Rescue units were on scene, but there was another ambulance there. So you and your partner get there. What do you do once you arrive on scene? Uh, we got on scene. We parked the rescue in the back, or in the meet, or in the turn lane, removed the stretcher from the back of the ambulance and started making our way to a young female that was laying on the sidewalk that Ocala Fire Rescue was currently assessing once we arrived there. She was deceased, and we kind of didn't know where to turn at that point because there was a lot of chaotic, chaos going on at that point. You say chaos. What did that include? 
a lot of people that were on scene that were just walking over the young lady that was deceased, dead body on the sidewalk. They were stepping over her. No one really had control of the scene as far as my opinion goes. Um, there was multiple, I would say hundreds of people there just crowding the area, you know, running back and forth across the highway, not staying away from the scene like they should have been. So there were citizens there? Yes. There were law enforcement officers there? Yes. There were other medics, rescue type people there? Yes. Okay. Um, did you have any idea before you arrived how many people had been shot? We had an estimate, but not to an exact number. We knew that it was a life threat, multiple people down situation that we got dispatched to, but no, we did not have an exact number of individuals that were shot at that time. Okay. After you were aware that the young lady was deceased, that you first were going over to, where did you go next? Uh, we went south right to the patient that we, or it had actually been north of Cloud Nine where Murphy's Oyster Bar is. We went to a squad car that had a uh, young male leaning against it that had been shot in the left leg. How did you arrive at that location? Were you directed there? Um, yes, we were directed there because, like I said, it was very chaotic. And at one point or another, I remember turning to my partner saying, I'm going to go look for a patient. And what we've been taught when there's a chaotic scene is to never leave your partner's side. So about the time I started walking away, I said, you know what, I'm not going to do that. And about that time, I think... I don't remember if it was an OPD officer or a Mary County Sheriff's deputy that came up to us and directed us to the patient that we ended up transporting. When you arrived at that at that young male, like what did you notice about him? I uh, noticed that he had a tourniquet wrapped around his left thigh, upper portion of his leg, and had a wound at that point that I could not assess because he had blue jeans on. He said he had been shot, which I believe that he was shot. And once we got to his side, we basically assessed him as fast as we could because we didn't want to remain there any longer than we could or should have, per se. So once we got him picked up, put him on the stretcher, he seemed very distraught, very upset that he'd been shot, obviously. Um, we got him in the back of the ambulance, and that's where we cut his blue jeans off and assessed the area of the gunshot wound. When you were assessing the area where he had the gunshot wound, could you determine that he had an exit wound and an entrance wound? I believe that is what my report says, yes. How long would you estimate you were on that scene? Um, very short amount of time because we wanted to find a patient leave because me and my partner both after the fact discussed that the situation was not safe for us to be there so we're taught to come get what a patient and leave to not pollute the scene or crowd the scene. So I'm going to guess it was, seemed like three to six minutes maybe. So fairly quick. Fairly quick, yes. And where did you take that young man? Ocala Regional Medical Center. It is the trauma center for Marion County Fire, or Marion County. And you released him to the hospital staff? Yes, we did. No further questions. No questions. No questions. Yes, sir. All right, so you can go back to the Thank you. Call your next one. City Call to Maya Wadley. Can you introduce yourself to the jury and spell your name for our court reporter? My name is Tamaya Wadley. Tamaya, T-H-O-M-I-A, Watley, W-A-D-L-E-Y. You live here in Ocala, Ms. Watley? Yes, sir. Have you lived here all your life? No, sir. How long have you lived here for? Say about 15 years. No, I'm not supposed to ask, but how old are you? 23. So most of your life you've lived here. You say you grew up here? You can say that. I want to ask you about something that happened on September 13th of 2015. Did you go to the Cloud Nine nightclub that night? Yes, sir. Who'd you go to Cloud Nine with? Andre Bell. And why'd you go that night? My friend wanted to go, just went with her. And what were you all going there to do? Just have a good time. What would having a good time consist of? Drinking a little bit, partying, hanging, talking with friends. When you go out and about, 
like the Cloud Nine at night. Do you see people that you know? Yes, sir. You know a lot of people? Yes, sir. Do you use Facebook? Yes, sir. Are there people that you're familiar with through Facebook? Yes, sir. Are, are they people you can be familiar with through Facebook who you then will see in yes, the nightclub? Are you familiar with anybody named Laquan Barrow? I'm familiar with the name. Did, have you, are you familiar with him through Facebook? Yes, sir. What name does he go by on Facebook? Sosa. Um, does he use the name Laquan or Quan in that name? I don't remember. Do you see that gentleman here in the courtroom today? Yes, sir. Can you describe what he's wearing to the jury? A black shirt and a gray black tie. May the record reflections identify from Quan Barrow? Record will soon reflect. Are you familiar with somebody named Gary King? I'm familiar with the name. Can you put a face with the name? Yes, sir. Do you see the face here in court today? Yes, sir. Can you describe what he's wearing? A blue shirt. Do you know if him and Mr. Barrow are related? No, sir. Are you familiar with somebody named Michael Smith? Yes, sir, the name. Can you put a face with the name? Yes, sir. Do you see that face in court today? Yes, sir. Can you describe him for the jury? Uh, burning his shirt. Any the record reflections identified Michael Smith? Record will so reflect. Did you see any of those gentlemen on September 13, 2015 at Cloud Nine? Yes, sir. Who? Uh, Quan. Where did you see Quan? Inside the club. Do you know somebody named Nathaniel Kendrick? Yes, sir. Kind of in the same way you know Mr. Barrow, Mr. Smith, and Mr. King? Yes, sir. Um, you know somebody named Danielle Kendra? Yes, sir. In the same way? Yes, sir. Did you know a young lady named Benitria Robinson? Yes, sir. Did you know Benitria a little better? Yes, sir. When did you first meet her? Um, it was a while ago. We played ball together, so. What kind of ball? Basketball. About how old were you when you met her? I want to say 16, something like that. Was she your age? Um, she was, say, a year or two younger than me. And then what was the context you first met her in? On the basketball court. And you remember who you were playing for then or what kind of game it was? I was playing for Westport High School. It was like a rival game. Who did she play for? Forest High School. <clears throat> how many times in the season do Westport and Forest girls basketball, how often do you all play? Play like three times in one season because they were like a rival team, so we played them a lot. Other than playing basketball against Penetria in high school games, do you play anywhere else? Yes, we played at a um, recreation park called the Auditorium. Is that here in Ocala? Yes, sir. The War Memorial Auditorium? I'm sorry? The War Memorial Auditorium? I just called it the all. I'm not sure. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, did you, apart from playing basketball with Benitri, did you know her socially? Yes, a little bit. And why was that? Um, one of my ex-friends was really close with her, so that made me kind of close to her, too. Um, as of September 13, 2015, do you know what was going on in Benitria's life? Yes, sir. What was that? Um, she was in college playing basketball, and she also received a scholarship for softball. Was she good? Yes, yeah, she was very good. But she was in town that weekend? Yes, sir. Did you see her at the Final Night Nightclub? Yes, sir. Did you talk to her? Yes, sir. What was she doing that? She was just standing, looking around. She was one of the first persons I seen when I walked inside. Did you go up and talk to her? Yes, sir. Ms. Wabi, while you were in the nightclub, did you see any type of fight or altercation occur? Yes, sir. Between who? Um, Danielle and Maisha. Who's Maisha? She is Kwan's sister. Do you know Maisha? Not like that, no, I don't. Kind of like you know Kwan? Yes, sir. Kind of like you know Gary? 
compressor or hydrogen compressor. How close were, was the altercation to you, Ms. Walker? That was pretty close. It was like right in front of you. They bumped into you at all? I'm not sure if they did, but someone did. I'm not sure if they did. Did you see anybody else get involved in the altercation? Yes, sir. Who? Quan. What did Quan do? He was pushing people around. Anybody else? No, sir. Did the altercation get broken up? Yes, sir. How did it get broken up? Uh, I'm not sure if there were security guards or just random people, but random people were just breaking it up, trying to stop the fight. What happened after that? They got kicked out of the club, and the club just started back up. Did you go outside? After the club ended, yes, sir. About how much later was that, if you remember? I really can't remember. It wasn't too late after. When you went outside, were you with anybody? Yes, sir. Who were you with? Audrey Bell. What happened when you and Audrey walked outside? Um, we kind of stopped, like, not too far from the front of the door. She pulled out her phone. We heard yelling. As soon as I looked down at her phone, we heard shots, and we started to run. What direction did you run this morning? Uh, coming out the club, I ran to my left. Tell where the gunfire was coming from? It sounded like it was coming from my right side, but I'm not sure exactly where it was coming from. Were you shot? Yes, sir. When did you first realize you were shot? When I fell to the ground. Where were you shot? My leg. What part of your leg? I got shot in the ankle and it came out the other side of my calf muscle. Did you see who was shooting that night? No, sir. Did you go to the hospital? Yes, sir. The injury you received, does it still affect you today? Yes, sir. What the jury have? I get charged with horses almost every morning. Um, I can't sit for long. I can't stand for long. Do you play basketball? Not like I used to. Do you know if Quan, Gary, and Mr. Smith associate with one another? I don't know. I know some questions. Good afternoon, Ms. Wadley. Good afternoon. Ms. Wadley, um, when you went to the club that night, uh, and you walked outside. Did you see Michael Smith outside? No, sir. I mean, no, ma'am. I'm sorry. Okay. Did you see um, anybody with guns? No, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Ms. Marvel, you indicated that you know Mr. King from <coughs> Facebook. Is that right? Yes, sir. And did you see him at the club that night? No, sir. Not at all? Anywhere, anytime? No, sir. Thank you. Do you know um, Nick Fincher? By Facebook. You know who has a nickname? Not that I know of. What about um, Danielle Kendrick? Does she have a nickname? Dee. Now, you indicated... Um, Aisha and Edie were involved in an altercation at the bar close to you, correct? Yes, sir. Did you see Nate Kendrick become involved in that altercation in any way, trying to separate people or anything else? No, sir. And I heard your testimony that Quan was pushing people around. Was that trying to break up the fight? I'm not sure what he was trying to do. I'm not sure what he was trying to do. As a result of that, did the bouncers come over? I've seen people breaking it up, but I'm not sure if they were a bouncer, security, I'm not sure. 
The bouncers at Cloud Nine wear what color shirts? I'm not sure. Did you ever see a bouncer that evening with a um, a firearm? No, sir. Thank you. Anything else? Excused? She is wrong. All right, you can go Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we've reached a reasonable place to stop today. We went a little bit past five. We had some things going on earlier this afternoon. So I'm going to remind you again, I'll remind you every time we break, especially overnight, please try to avoid media, locales in Urbana, just on the website. Television news, local station, Orlando, one of the games that I don't know. I can't tell at this point who might be broadcasting because they can plug into a feed downstairs and it could be every one of them downstairs. So just avoid local news. Uh, Facebook, probably a really bad place to go. Uh, so Save that. And this is all over with. With that, enjoy your evening, and uh, we'll see you back here tomorrow morning. Uh, all right, Jerry's out of the courtroom. We'll be in recess unless there's something we need to talk about right now. I'd like just like a couple things in regards to schedule. Okay. Um, one of my witnesses is employed and had to get permission to be off on Monday. That's going to change. telling me you won't need a whole day, she doesn't need a whole day, and you don't need a whole day, then I'm thinking we may have this case to the jury perhaps on Tuesday. Correct. But at least we have a day, a buffer day. So. And just one other issue, um, one of my witnesses in this room, Frank Ritz, is in custody. We'd like to provide him the clothes to testify in front of the jury. Okay. Same as you went through your client. Make sure we know who he is so we, he can get dressed out ahead of time and so that we wait a half hour. So. Yes, All right. Be in recess till tomorrow morning at 8 30.